um, here we go. Uh, 90 countries and counting, the story behind the story, the story. So uh, those of you that have been on my travel blog have seen this quote. Um, it's from Mark Twain. Travel is fatal to prejudice, bigotry, and narrow-mindedness. And many of our people need it sorely on these accounts, I think especially today. Broad, wholesome, charitable views of men and things cannot be acquired by vegetating in one little corner of the earth all one's lifetime. Huh. And I love this quote. But Sonia, you got to add women to that. It said men. Well, it's women. a generic. It's a generic. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so 90 countries and counting. I, I don't expect you to read these. I'm just going to sort of let them come up on the screen. It's a lot of countries. And that was just Europe. We've got Asia and the Middle East. We've got North America. We've got South America, Oceania, Africa, and Antarctica. I have, in fact, been to all seven continents Here's another way to look at it on a world map. Um, either way, I've been to a lot of countries. I love to travel. I have always loved to travel. Luckily, Andy, my husband of blessed memory, also loved to travel. It was one of the things that we had in common. And we spent a lot of time going around the world. As an aside, Stuart, I think you took that middle lower picture of us <laughs> in our orange yes. jacket. Uh, yes. So um, we did a lot of traveling until two years ago when he passed away, but that hasn't stopped me. Once the world opened up again after the pandemic, off I went. And as a retired professor as a medical school here in San Diego, I was lucky to be able to trot around the world. One of the perks of academia is that we, in fact, do get to travel to meetings, to give invited talks. Throughout my career, I have always tried to take advantage of that perk of travel by adding on trips to exotic and not so exotic places. So many of my colleagues will travel for hours or days just to go to their hotel, go to the meeting, go back to the hotel and go home. Not me. I would always add on, whether it was taking the time to see the city I was in or the surrounding areas, or whether it was traveling to some other city or other place close by. For example, um, I was at a meeting in Seoul, South Korea. These are some pictures of Seoul. And I decided to add on nine days in Vietnam. My South Korean colleagues looked at me like I was crazy and they said, not close. Vietnam, not close. And they were right. It was another seven hours, but it was a lot closer coming from San, than coming from San Diego. And so it was a great way to see Vietnam. These are some of the pictures from Vietnam. This is Halong Bay. Oh, gorgeous. This is also Vietnam. That's you there, Sonia? No. This is, yes. Well, here, let me get a pointer going. This is me right here. This oh. is my dear friend, Phyllis, who is also um, in the sleep field. And since we were always at the same meetings, we traveled together. She and her husband and Andy and I did a lot of our traveling together. This is the Mao Mausoleum in, uh, in Beijing. And these are all the people lined up waiting to go in to see his body. Hmm. In Hanoi. Uh, in Hanoi, yes. I said in Beijing, I'm sorry, in Hanoi. And this is still in Vietnam. Another time I was invited to give a talk in Perth, Australia. Now that was a long trip. I think that was one of the farthest places I've ever traveled to. So we opened up a map and I said to Andy, where do you want to go? We actually opened up an atlas, a paper atlas. And he looked at the map of Australia and he pointed just north of it. And we added on 10 days in Papua New Guinea. 
another place never would have got gotten to if uh, if we hadn't decided being so close in Australia to go there. According to a survey of world cities, Port Moresby, the capital of Papua New Guinea, is one of the worst, least livable city, ranked 139 of 140 cities rated. And it's the second most dangerous place in the world. I still don't know which city is number one, but you can see there were armed guards everywhere and barbed wire. And yet I have to say it was one of the most beautiful and exciting places I've ever been to. Roberta and Arnie who are on the call uh, with us today were with me there. Papua New Guinea is a magical place full of contradictions. The land that forgot time. The first white man to end, no, I'm sorry, I got that wrong. It's the land that time forgot. The uh -huh. first white men to enter the interior of Papua New Guinea were the Leahy brothers in 1930. It was the last place on earth to be colonized by the Europeans. But there was little to attract the white man there until gold was discovered. The natives had no idea about civilization. They thought the white man was lightning from the sky or that their ancestors had turned white and were returning from the place of the dead. Uh. They knew nothing of the outside world. In fact, they thought they were the only people in the world until uh. the Leahy brothers showed up. The Leahys had backpacks with them and the natives thought that the white men's wives were inside the backpacks. And many of the people living there, at least as of 2018, when we were there, are still very primitive. They were not dressing up for us. This is how they dress. They often have um, grass through their nose. They have grass on their headdresses. Um, they are quite primitive and very beautiful people. Hmm. Oh. I'm sorry, I missed it. Is this in Papua? This is Papua New Guinea. Been there. <laughs> Been there. Yeah. yeah. I'm trying to get on the other end. Okay, the larger screen. Hang on, guys. And taking pictures? I huh. loved photography as far back as I can remember. I don't think of it as a camera, but rather as a passport that allows me to capture the world. Even before I retired, I always loved taking pictures. When I'm walking around, even without my camera, my eye is always framing what I see as if to get the best shot. Back in the day, I would shoot two to three rolls of film per day. That got pretty expensive. Digital is much better. <sighs> I may have got my love of photography from my father, blessed memory. He shot hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of slides. After my dad passed away, I took all those slides, looked through each one, and kept only the ones that had people in them that I knew. I had them transferred to video, 12 hours of video and then copied the video onto CDs. Who will ever watch them? Probably nobody. I've never even watched them. <laughs> and that's one of the reasons I started photo books and then the travel blog. And I'll just, this is my mother and my father. This was their wedding picture. And this is my sister who's also on, on the line. This is in Israel. Um, most of these are uh, the older ones. I think this was Switzerland, uh, but a lot of this is from Israel. Is your sister on the call, Sonia? She is. Annie. Okay. It says Annie. Oh, Annie, okay. Annie Gilbar is my sister. Okay, good. Wonderful. So then the blog began. The blog started out as a diary, or really more like notes that I would keep for myself. Then friends started asking me for advice on places I had visited visited. Like they'd say, you've been to Peru. What can you tell us about it? And I'd say, here, take my notes. And then the request started coming in, asking me to email my notes every time I got back from a trip. So I thought, oh, now I really have to write full sentences and, you know, make it a little better. So I started doing that. And I started expanding my notes a bit. 
Then requests came in to add pictures. I literally rolled my eyes. That took so much more work. I had to size the pictures and put them in a Word document and change it to a PDF, but I did that. And then I would email those out. And then about 10 years ago, a very wise friend from Singapore said to me, enough with the PDF, start a travel blog. And that's what I did. <sighs> so for those of you that have been on the blog, you see this is the sort of the cover page. Everyone takes pictures. I try to be creative with mine um, at the same time as I try to tell the story. I believe pictures need to tell a story. We're all visually overstimulated. So I try to make my pictures stand out. I try to catch, capture everyday life, whether of people or of wildlife. I try to let each photo give a sense of the location. These are a combination, some are from Maine and some are from Yellowstone. that halva? What do you have there? And then those bottom. are steps. Oh, That's steps. actually oh, okay. in, in Sfat in Israel. Those are stairs. Okay. okay. Yes. Yeah. It could look like halva. I could see that. You know where his mind is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I just might. Is Michael on? Michael, if you're there, say hello. You were going to come on. Michael just traveled with me to Borneo and he was going to come on the today. I also try to pack capture colors. I try to capture the smells. Yes, smells, even in a picture or in words. I wrote this in my Africa blog, and it took me weeks to get the words right. I'm going to read it to you. It's about the smell of the bush. As we drove along, I found myself taking big breaths, taking in the smell of the bush. This is a smell that is so hard to describe and has to be experienced. It was the smell of dampness and the morning dew, of wild crushed sage and rosemary and basil, beds of reeds and papyrus and other different grasses, tall and short, and the smell of the animals. There is no other smell like it. It wakes you up, it breathes life into you. It is freshness like nothing else I have ever smelled. It is the smell of the bush. Wow. We can smell and, it. Yeah. yeah. And then although I try to always have yeah, the story right. tell the place or the location, markets, of course, could be almost anywhere. And I love taking pictures in markets. There's so many similarities around the world. And that's an important lesson, too. The fact that there are so many similarities between different cultures. We can smell that too. <laughs> mm. Some of these uh, food pictures I, are, are framed up in my kitchen. Now there's the chalva in the center <laughs> there. Thank you. <laughs> That's also in Israel. You can see from the writing. And this is a combination, actually, these are all from Vietnam. Also the top left? The top left, the bottom left, and the top right are all from Sapa in the very north of Vietnam on the border with China. Um, it is one of the most beautiful, colorful places. And it's full of different um, Vietnamese tribes. and. I love the way they all dress. They each have, I don't like to call it a costume because it's not, it's their regular dress, but it's um, very traditional. And each one is more beautiful than the other. It's one of the things I love about traveling to cultures that are different than us because you do get to see how they dress. And I'll talk about that later on too. This is also Vietnam. Mm 
This is Israel. I was just there in March. Makes you hungry, doesn't it? Ah, the hummus. Yeah. The hummus, and then you have good hummus. <laughs> I cannot tell you where these are from. They're all somewhere in Asia, but bottom left might even be Morocco, I think. And I particularly love it when the vendors arrange their produce in a creative, beautiful way. And sometimes there's special treats. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best picture. When I use a wide lens, it throws the image away from the viewer. And sometimes that's what you wanna do, like with landscapes. Oh. Hmm. Yeah, Tibet. Hmm. No, that wasn't Tibet. I haven't been to Tibet. That was, um, I think that, that was-, was That was the time. tiger. That was Tiger's Nest? That was the Tiger's Nest, yep. Back there. Um, mm -hmm. This is the Tiger's Nest right here. Where Bhutan. is it? Yeah, that's in Bhutan. Oh, Bhutan. I have some more pictures of the Tiger's Nest later on. Are the hot air balloons Albuquerque? No, that's- Cappadocia. Yep, yeah. yeah. in uh, Turkey. Yeah, Turkey. Cappadocia is beautiful. I didn't hear where? Cappadocia in- uh, Thank Turkey. You. This is also Turkey. It has a lot of hoodoos. You see a lot of hoodoos there underneath the uh, where the balloons are. Beautiful. And this, this is oh. Easter Island. Mm -hmm. No. Oh. This is uh, Mongolia. That's a real photo on the left. Yes. Real it's life. These are all my photos. Ooh. Fabulous. That's a fabulous shot. Wow. Wow. Thank you. Just gorgeous. Oh. There's another uh, Tiger's Nest Monastery. And this is also Bhutan. This is on the way up to the monastery. Uh -huh. uh, this is um, in uh, Myanmar. Yeah. And this one is too, I think. Beautiful. These two are from Namibia in Africa. The sand. The middle one is Namibia. The lower left is Mongolia. The upper left is, oh my God, I could picture it. Um, the middle top is also Mongolia. The top right is Namibia. The bottom is, which falls is that? I can't, I think that's in Iceland. <sighs> um, the top left is Myanmar. Yeah. See, I forget sometimes where they're from. <laughs> 90 countries. Yeah. How, how long does it take you to plan a trip? It varies. Um, I, usually I book things a good year in advance um, because things fill wow. up. Um, I travel these days with groups and I'll, and I'll talk about that a little bit later and they fill up. And so you, you have to plan way ahead and to get the good best flights with the best seats, you have to plan ahead. Yeah. I use a travel agent almost always. Mm. So the top right here is also Sapa. I showed you markets in Sapa before. You can see the terrace fields are so spectacular there. What are those yurts? Are those yurts? Yeah, that's Mongolia. 
Yeah. That was actually a hotel we stayed in, but that's how the nomads live. They call them gears, but they're it's the same thing as yours. Cool. So you see, these are all shot with wide angle lenses. These are all landscapes for wide shots. But sometimes, more often than not, I zoom in and I compress the picture, trying to draw the viewer in. I try to capture details, eyes, hands, faces, feet. It's those details that show that life has been lived, both in humans and in animals. Sonia, where's the bottom left the boats with the colorful? Because it looks like Ghana, but I don't no, think you're in Ghana. No, it's, um, it's uh, Myanmar. It's uh, Inlay Lake. Uh, yeah. Really. Very similar. So this was a close-up, this is a close-up of a huge mural in Mongolia. And it was all made out of these little tiny horses. And I shot the close-up, but I neglected to shoot the big wide part. So it's one of those pictures that got away. There's always pictures that get away. But here's some examples of a wide lens on the left and close up on the right. And I'll, I'll go through a few of these. So you can see the difference when you shoot wide or close. All right, those of you from Israel, you know, Anna, you can't answer. Do you know where, uh, Yael, you know where this is from? Or Caesarea? 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 Caesarea. Caesarea. It's Kibbutz Lachamei HaGetaot, Akko and Naria. Well, I said Akko. You said Akko, I didn't hear you. You were close. Similar. <laughs> you were close, yes. This is the aqueduct along the road um, just north of Akko. Um, and my family is from this kibbutz. But what notice also what I want to point out here in terms of photography, not just wider and close up, but taking different angles. See how I put the camera really low and I'll point this out later when I show, show some flower pictures, but you get down real low on the ground and you get a whole different perspective of so what pretty. you're looking at. This is Yellowstone. Mm. This is Mongolia. And Botswana. So white is good, but close up is good too. You need them both. Huh. And, uh, and How close were you really to the lions? I was yeah. I was using a, a long lens. So we How were too far. we were in a car and we weren't that far really. But, but I I'll show you at the end. I I I travel with a very long lens. That one was a 600 millimeter lens so I could get really close. Mm. Wow. These are beautiful. Beautiful bird. This is a kingfisher, one of my favorite birds. Yeah. Yeah. Tucan? No. No. Um, uh, oh hornbill. Rhinoceros. Hornbill. This hornbill. is the yeah, oh. rhinoceros hornbill. They're very uh, common to Borneo, which I was just in Borneo a few weeks ago. Again, you can see the stark difference between shooting from far wow. and then getting up close. That's amazing. To be honest, I didn't shoot it that close. What I did is I cropped. I took the picture on the left and I cropped it wow, to get the close so up. So wow. sometimes it's in the editing, not just in taking the picture. I hope you framed it, Sonia. I did not. I have not even printed it. <laughs> Dying. But editing, you know, I don't talk about editing at all in this talk, but editing is very important. I mean, I shoot thousands of pictures when I travel per trip, thousands, but I'm very good at deleting. It's very important. Well, some photographers say you should never delete anything, but I delete unless it's a perfect picture. Yeah, I take multiples of the same thing and I, I just cut it down so that I'm left with just the very best. So as I said, I do a lot of close-ups of faces and animal faces are easy because you don't have to ask their permission. You just <laughs> focus on their eyes and shoot. Uh, 
Oh my God, yeah. here they look at this. Yep. Mm -hmm. The bottom left is a beluga whale. I was in Churchill, Canada in July where they get thousands of beluga whales coming in in the summer. They are the cutest little things. They're not so little, they're actually quite big. <laughs> they are so cute. As opposed to the top left, which is a giant otter in the Pantanal who are ferocious looking, or the leopard seal on the top center who are also mean. Hmm. Wow. <laughs> These are gorillas. Oh. Um, last yeah, December, yeah. I went trekking, gorilla trekking in Uganda. It was an unbelievable experience. It was the hardest trip I've ever done in my life. Um, because you're trekking through forests, there are no paths, there are no trails, you're literally making your way through all the brush and fallen trees, and it was hard. But then you get to see these magnificent, magnificent creatures. These are the babies. Oh, yes. It's a silverback. Yeah, it's a silverback. And these are orangutans from Borneo. Mm -hmm. Oh, the babies. These are proboscis monkeys, also yeah. from Borneo. Okay. Oh my God. <laughs> I know, yeah. aren't they something? They actually are so, so cute. <laughs> And then sometimes you have to dress just like them. Oh, that's great. What a great <laughs> shot. Great. So great. I didn't realize I was dressing like them until someone pointed at me, <laughs> my daughter, who's on this call, with my beige pants and my yellow t shirt. I sort of looked like a monkey. Uh, These are sun bears, also from Borneo. And some snakes. Some lizards. That blue one is in Uganda. It is the most spectacular thing I've ever seen. And it was so fast, I was shocked that I even managed to get a picture at all. Like zoomed around. It looks it like looks a mosaic. Like like Gaudi in Barcelona. It does, exactly right. It reminded me of, of the Gaudi. These are called silver leaf monkeys. These are also in Borneo. They reminded me of little old men. Nice. Is that the sweetest? <laughs> and this is a red leaf monkey. His little faces. These are orangutans again. We do look like monkeys, right, Sonia? We do. And you know what? We, really have, do. we share 95% of our genetics with the gorillas. 98% with chimps. Yeah. Chimps are closer. Yeah. Wow. Do they have sleep apnea? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> oh, this bigger Probably photo with some the baby. <laughs> Stunning. And sometimes I don't know what I've shot until I look at it. So this picture on the uh, on the right, I didn't realize until I looked at the picture on my computer that the baby was nursing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. And as I said, I really like to capture the detail, hands, faces, because as I said, that's what really shows you about life. And look, don't they look almost human? Look at that lower, the gorilla on the lower it's a hand. Left. It could be a, a human hand. Yeah. And I love the one where he's holding the bananas and all you see sticking out of the trees. Uh, Unbelievable. Look at that foot. 
Oh, God. <sighs> but this is my favorite shot. Oh, wow. Yeah. If you look closely in his eyes, you can see my reflection. I see. Wow. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Stunning. But the camera. Wow. So I said, you know, um, oh, let me go back a little. Um, with what animals, is it's easy to take close-ups because you don't have to ask their permission. But with people, people are letting you into their lives. You're developing a relationship with them when you take their picture. When you let them know that you're passionate about their culture, about them, about their lives, they let you in, sometimes. I try to always ask permission, usually with sign language. I hold out my camera and they understand and then they smile at you and that's the best part. And that's the part I try to capture. Mm. <laughs> Eyes. <laughs> so this is a video we were driving along in uganda and um sometimes you have to do a video to really capture the moment these children ran over to the car and started singing oh um, there's nothing like that nothing. and often after I take a picture I show it to the person on the back of my camera and I wish I could photograph that moment sometimes my friends capture it because when you show them their picture that elicits the biggest smile of all and by sharing that experience with them I've made a new friend when I was in Uganda last December, we were in a market and the women were hesitant to have their picture taken. I asked again by sort of showing the camera um, if I could take a picture of their children and they nodded yes. When I then showed them the picture of their children, they agreed to have their picture taken too. It's yeah. all about building trust. It probably didn't hurt that I tried to do what they routinely do. I tried to be a part of their lives. <laughs> <laughs> now, I have to admit, in all fairness, I took my hands off the pineapple for about two seconds, and luckily the picture was snapped in time. <laughs> I could not balance it the way they could. And sometimes when I ask if I can take their picture, they shake their head no. And then I try to take a mental picture instead <laughs> hoping that I will remember their beautiful faces. I also love close-ups of flowers. You can see the texture and you can almost smell the fragrance. And again, this is when I try to get down low. Sometimes I even put the camera on the ground and shoot up so that you're getting the underside of the flowers. Well, that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. And birds. Penguins are some uh, of my favorite. Yeah. So I met Roberta and Arnie, who are on this call, on our trip to Antarctica. And I traveled to South Georgia and the Falklands with uh, Stuart and Hillary, who are on this call. Sometimes you catch them soaring through the air. Other times they're catching their favorite morsel. Stunning. Wow. Stunning. Look at the fish you got. So many. Yeah. Um, are you guys hearing me okay? Because Jeremy yes. says he lost because the audio. So I can hear you. you sound perfect. Okay. All right. Jeremy, I don't know what to tell you. 
No, we just, the the video that you played of the kids singing, we didn't hear that. We oh. hear you just fine. Yeah. Oh, okay. Right. Did everyone else hear the video? Yeah. No. I, I thought it was uh, meant to not to be heard. It's oh, I wonder, oh, I'm so sorry. That was the best part. They were singing at us. Oh, dear. Oh, well. Mm. I should have checked it with you, Jeremy, on how to do it. So other times when you're doing birds, they're just perched on the tree branch, watching you, watching them. Hmm. And there's the jabiru. Mm -hmm. And you can't talk about things that fly without talking about butterflies. Mm -hmm. I try to get action shots, but more often than not, it's the quiet moments that tell the best story, the story of life. And you don't always have to catch people's or animals' faces to tell a story. Sometimes photographing them from the back tells an even bigger story. So the center one is my friend Phyllis and I, and I think many of you can recognize that that's the, the Western Wall, no? Yeah, it's Western the Wall, wall. Jerusalem, yeah. The story of life is also in festivals. I love festivals. I love visiting countries during their festivals because that's when you see the local people come out in their best dress, just having a great time. And sometimes the pictures speak to social action. Forests all over the world are disappearing, in part to the planting of palm tree plantations for producing palm oil. Palm oil is in everything we eat and we use, makeup, cleansing products, everything. And with the loss of the forests, wildlife is losing their habitat. It's like a domino effect. Not all palm oil production is bad. It does bring income to many small, poor communities around the world but it's about sustainability and doing it the right way. And part of the telling the story is also documenting the mundane, like shopping. Okay, maybe that's not so mundane. When I buy something from a local, I always try to take a picture with them. It helps me remember them and it creates even more memories around that souvenir or special something that I found. This man in the center, who you see a close up on the left, made that mask, which I bought. That's also in Papua New Guinea. And on the, on the right, um, the man had carved um, figurines and I bought some of the figurines from him. And this man, also, this is also in Papua New Guinea. I bought that yellow mask there that he had made. Looks familiar. And if I'm, oh, no. And sometimes you need the picture um, of negotiations. You got to bargain. So here I am bargaining for this hat and she tries it on me and I bought it and happily have our picture taken together. <laughs> it all tells the story. I always take a picture of my hotel room. Hopefully I remember to take it before I mess up the room. <laughs> and sometimes I'll take pictures of food at restaurants but I'm not showing you those because you all do that. Well, maybe just one, <laughs> just because, does that not look delicious? This yes. was in, in Doha, Qatar. Although it could have just as easily been Israel or anywhere in the Middle East. You also have to open to new experiences. When I was planning our first trip to Africa, we included 10 days in Namibia. 
There was an area of the country I particularly wanted to see, but the lodge there was very, very expensive. So I said to my travel agent, find a way, because I'm not paying that. So find a way for me to, to be there. And he thought for a moment, and then he said, well, you can camp. I looked at him and I said, do you know me? <laughs> I always try to be more comfortable when I travel than uh, more comfortable than I am at home. But then I thought about it and I thought, hmm, why not? It could be a lot of fun. And it ended up being the high point of the trip. We had this beautiful shower just outside in the heat of the water in the uh, campfire every morning. And we had this beautiful view of the mountain while we were in the shower. We had a toilet seat so we could actually sit and do our business. The beds uh, were just cots. We put them on the floor because they weren't great. Those days I could still get down on the floor. Um, we had gourmet food. We had our own chef, who was also a guide, but uh, he actually made us croissants from scratch on the campfire. It was amazing. So you have to keep an open mind when you're traveling. You never know what new experiences you'll have. You want to be adventurous, do things you might not usually do at home, like holding an eagle or a falcon or riding camels or horses. So this is also in um, uh, Bhutan. I'm on the horse. I'm riding up. You get to you, you're able to ride halfway up to the Tiger's Nest Monastery if you want. And I don't know if you can tell the horse is walking at the edge of this really big drop. And I am holding on so tight to this horse, my knuckles were white, but I did it and I made it. <laughs> so this is also a video. There's no real sound here so much. So, um, cause again, the sound might, might not work, but <coughs> watch it. And that's me, that's my back. Unbelievable. Look how close that gorilla was to me. The first time that happened, my, my porters, my guides said, shoot, shoot, meaning with my camera, of course. And I absolutely froze. And the second time it happened, I wasn't going to move. I just stood there taking pictures. They finally had to move me a little bit out of the way. <laughs> you also want to document the different ways you travel by boat or kayak in this case, by plane, by train, by car. That's all part of the story. I'm not actually flying the plane here. I just got to sit next to the pilot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Roberta, hope you and Arnie, I hope you see yourselves there. And I follow the light. For me, it's all about the light. Sunrises, and yes, you have to get up really early. The dawn. Beautiful. And sunsets. And you want to look for both sunrises and sunsets with unusual perspectives. It's not always just shooting straight at the sky. This is one of my favorite ones where the sunset was reflected in Andy's sunglasses. Yeah. Mm. Great. And then the Milky Way. Mm. Was Patagonia beyond? No, um, actually, uh, there are different places. Some of it is the Pantanal, some of it is Africa, some of it is Israel. Or the um, Northern Lights, the Aurora Borealis. Mm -hmm. And here you have to be out very late at night. And you want to look around while you're doing these pictures to see what else might tell the story. It was really cold out there shooting the Northern Lights. And here's one way to, um, to show that. It was minus 25 degrees. They had a thermometer out there though, just to make sure we knew. And even the rain or snow can make fabulous photographs and tell the story. Arnie and Roberta, that's you in the bottom right corner there. Mm -hmm. This was at uh, Victoria Falls, pouring rain. I also love reflections. One of my guides once said, a shot of the building is a document. A reflection is a statement. 
And so I always shoot reflections when I see them. And sometimes you just have to take a selfie. <laughs> good ones. What are your but tips for a good selfie? What are your tips for a good selfie? I, I would not show you the most of the ones that I have taken. Um, but even here, notice I try to get a different perspective. So in the two top ones, I had the the uh, the phone. This is these are obviously the phone on the ground, and so I'm shooting up. And one of them, I wanted to get the ceiling, and the other, again, it's getting the under part of the flowers. Uh, the bottom right there is my friend Marilyn, who is now one of my travel buddies. And most important, don't forget to leave time to relax. Always. And to have a good time. The bottom left is lemonade. It's not always alcohol. Mm -hmm. So I want to say a word about the dress or the so-called uniform. So, you know, as I mentioned earlier, in many places around the world, people have their, their outfits, their dress that they wear that are very traditional. In um, Bhutan on the left, those were our, that was our guide and our driver. And you can see in Bhutan, all the men dress the same way. It's different patterns, different fabric, but they all have that same outfit. And the women have similar ones, but with long skirts. And I am convinced that as we all travel the world, people look at us and think in America, everybody wears these khaki travel shirts and, and pants. <laughs> <laughs> right? We all wear those when we travel. And of course, you have to take your Alambica shots wherever you <laughs> to find them. So this was in Israel. That's very cool. For those interested, this is my camera equipment. I uh, travel with two camera bodies. Um, a couple of years ago, I switched from Nikon to Olympus. Um, my go-to lens is a 12 to 100. I go with a 100 to 400 zoom. For those of you that know camera equipment, I'm shooting at a three uh, quarters frame, which means each of those lenses is double. So when I say 12 to 100, it's really a 24 to 200. The one to 400 is really a 200 to 800. I take a wide angle with me and sometimes a fisheye, um, although I don't often use that one. I have what's called a lens flipper. That's down here. If you guys want to know what that is later, if you care, I'll tell you. But it's like having a third arm when you're switching lenses. I always take, of course, my battery charger and a lot of batteries and an extension cord. And then what you don't see here in the picture is I have an external drive to back up all my pictures, a laptop, a tripod. And um, now more recently, I'm going to start taking a monopod. I learned that because my friend Michael, who may or may not be on this call, lent me his in Borneo and boy, did that make a difference. The last few things I wanna mention are my rules for travel. The first is about what you take with you when you travel. I have only two words, travel light. The picture on the left where you see all that luggage, that was for six people. Um, if you look, oops, here, this is my bag. I'll take that bag for two, three, even four weeks. Tr packing for two weeks is no different than packing for one. Packing for four weeks is no different than packing for one. You do the laundry. That's what the sink is for. And the more, the lighter you travel, the more fun and the easier it'll be. The other rules, and, and this is on the, the site, the well on the um, Alan Bika website, is don't rush and don't be cheap. Go for the highest level of comfort that you can afford. That's going to be different for different people, but go the best way you can because that'll make you the most comfortable. Get a guide. You know, when I was younger, Andy and I used to just take a guidebook and go on our own. And now we, I, now I want to have a guide, whether it's a private guide or going with a small group. I travel a lot now with either uh, National Geographic or Natural Habitat. 
They're, they tend to be small groups, 10, 12 people. And it, I know it's safe. I know they're going to take care of everything. And most importantly, they're going to tell me what I'm looking at. My husband was fond of saying a stone is just a stone, unless you know the history or the story <laughs> behind it. He used to say that, especially in Israel, because there's so many stones and there's so much history with each stone. But that's what the guide is for. So you know what you're looking at. And if you're not going with a group, I always liked having a driver because that way I could spend my time looking out the window at the scenery and not trying to navigate unfamiliar roads. And these are two of my, my recent guides. So I'm not done traveling yet. In November, I returned to Churchill, Canada for the third time, this time to see polar bears. Next year, I'm booked to go to India, Baja to see whales, Madagascar, Tanzania, Kenya, Greenland, a train ride through Switzerland, Normandy, and then back to Rio, Brazil for a meeting. And of course, I'll find something to add on to, to that. And there's still so many other places I want to experience for as long as I can, have camera, will travel. That's it. Thank you. Thank I'm going to leave this up just for a moment. Uh, those, if you are interested in my blog, there's the address. It's journeyswithsonia.com. I would be honored if you signed up. And if you follow Instagram, it's also Journeys with Sonia. And the last couple of weeks, I um, stop sharing. The last couple of weeks, I started posting a picture a day. I was told I had to do that. So I'm trying to post a picture a day. So you'll get a little bit of, of what I'm doing. But if you really want the stories and the full pictures behind it, then you got to sign up for the blog. Sonia. <laughs> I almost want to say, let's not add a word. <laughs> Just to take it in, I almost want to feel like let's be quiet for two minutes if we can, because it's almost want to cry. It's so beautiful. Stuart, want to say something? But I'm just going to yeah. say goodbye. We're just going to goodbye. Oh, I guess I know what's got to do. Take care, Sonia. I'll see you in January. Thanks for being here. Can't wait. Pleasure. I will let, uh, of course, if anyone wants to ask a question, but it's almost really so emotional. So uh, you took us around the world. It's just, uh, I'm, I'm overwhelmed. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I've never done this talk before. You know, you know me, I speak about sleep all the time, but <laughs> this was brand new for me. And I cannot tell you how many hours I spent putting this together. And it was so much fun because it forced me to go through all my pictures. And, you know, I don't often get to do that. And it was all the memories and it was really great. So thank you, Yael, for asking me to do this. I thank you. I do have a question though, just because of the emotions that came up during, um, just looking at the photos. When you go to all these remote areas, third world, and all these beautiful people. And sometimes there's a feeling that, ah, oh, I wanna take these people home. But when I looked and I said, wait, they might be very, very happy where they are. It's always this conflict of the West will destroy their happiness. I don't know, I wonder how you felt. Absolutely true, absolutely true. You know, I, I, I say this over and over again when I write in the blog about these places, I go, progress with a question mark, yeah. you know? these places that as they start getting westernized they lose their culture they lose who they are and i hate seeing that you know many of them like i'll just use uganda as an example the people there are very poor but they have food and they have a shelter over that roof over their head and they're very happy you know they really are so, so the video you couldn't hear of the kids as they were singing we're happy to see you today you know they're, they're not, they're not hurting. I mean, there are lots of people around the world that are hurting. I, I don't want to play that down, but, um, you know, you can't, you can't put our culture on them. Um, even though often they want it. It, it. I remember when we were in Mongolia and we're driving through the Gobi desert and there are no roads, you're driving on the sand. And they try to have the cars drive in the same track so that you're not totally destroying 
the, the little vegetation that's there. And I was thinking, you know, you come back in five years and um, it is going to be a paved road here, you know, in the, through the middle of the Gobi. And I had a discussion with one of the people on, on the trip. Is that progress? Yes, you want to protect the desert, but you're losing, you know, what's here. Uh, the, the nomads in Mongolia used to only be on horses and camels. Now they have trucks, you know, so the world is changing. We can't stop it. And if that's what they want, you know, they should get that. But, but I, I worry about cultures being lost. I see there's a question from Sarah, just unmute yourself. Yeah, uh, my mom was actually raised in Mexico City. Mm -hmm. And so I actually watched that happen because the first, the first few times I was in Mexico City was in the 50s and then in the 60s and in the 70s. And it was a huge change. And it was actually, you're right, it was kind of heartbreaking yeah. uh, to go when everything was just really vibrant colors and different yeah. tastes and smells and stuff. And then, and then after, after a while, you're there and you're looking at McDonald's, like, really? Yes. You know, I say, it's somewhere in the blog, I say, my goal is to get to places before Starbucks gets there. I love my Starbucks at home. I don't want to see it around the world. The problem is it's too late. They're everywhere. But yes, it's that westernization uh, of places. Uh, yeah. Thank you for your comment, Sarah. Carolyn. Tonya, are you over 50? I am going to be 71 in a couple months. Girl, you rock. Oh, thank you. It was just so inspiring. I was in the Peace Corps in the 60s in Venezuela. Oh, yeah. And we brought, we, I, I didn't do much damage, <laughs> I don't think. But um, it's just, it's the, the, the photography is just breathtaking. It was such a stunning, stunning time to go with you. Thank you so much. And Thank share you. this with everybody who's sitting at home and needs to go out and travel again. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Well, one, I'm glad this was recorded. I'm going to send the link. I've, I have a long list of people that have asked to see if we can be here today. So I will share the link with them. And if I get invited in other places, it'll be fun to give the talk again. Hi, can I? Yes. I to say, hi. Oh. Wait, hold on. I, I, I'm confused. Jane? Oh, yeah. sorry. Hi. Go ahead. Um, I, I had a question about what uh, groups you like or you like to travel with what companies yeah so the two companies i mostly travel with are um natural habitat i travel with them a lot i've been about seven trips with them and i think i have four or five more scheduled in the next year um i really like them a lot and if i can just give a little plug if you decide to travel with them tell them i sent you because then i get a discount on my next trip why not um but i i like them and, and many of the companies are, are like this, but um, they're small groups. As I said, they're 10 to 12 people. When, went to Uganda, the limit was going to be eight and there were only three of us. So it was great. Um, and it's safe. If they think, you know, COVID's safe. If they think it's not going to be safe, they've canceled. Them. I've had so many trips with them canceled and rescheduled in the last couple of years. So I feel comfortable. I know if they say it's a go, it's okay. It's okay to go. Their guides are fabulous. They always have, they have special photography trips, which I actually don't go on because the friends I travel with are not photographers. But even on the regular trips, the guide is always a fabulous photographer. So you can get clues and they'll help you with, with uh, any photography questions. Even if you're shooting with an iPhone, iPhones have great cameras now mm -hmm. and they'll help you with those as well. So Natural Habitat is one of them. And the other one I travel with is uh, National Geographic. Oh. They're both excellent. Gail, did you have a question? Oh, well, just wanted to feed off of, when you went to Antarctica, which group did you, which? That was, that was National Geographic. You did, okay. Yeah. I just wanted to share your pictures were fabulous. Um, yeah. Thank you for sharing them. I've been to many of the places that you've been to. Nice. And uh, yeah, but to see it through someone else's eyes, the photos, 
I mean, I recognize the guy from Sing Sing from <laughs> New Guinea. Uh, we have one of those photos as well, but to see, the, again, see them through someone else's eyes, it, 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 it opens your own eyes once again to- Thank you. That's one of the beautiful things about photography is everyone sees things differently. Yep. And so I love seeing other people's pictures of the same trip I've just been on because it's yeah. a whole different perspective. Beautiful. So is Jane Scott still on? I'm trying to find you. Jane says she's been a travel agent and she said she signed up for the blog already. So I wanted to thank you, Jane. Mm. But I don't know if you're still here. And it's nice to meet your sister, Annie. Yeah. It's uh, nice Annie? to meet the family. Wait. Nice to meet the family and your daughter that left for it's Friday. Yeah, right? yeah. But so we're the lucky ones to be able to participate by watching <laughs> and feeling as if there's a chance on earth that we could learn from this because oh. Sony is extraordinary. Well, you're a little prejudiced. And my, I should introduce my brother-in-law, Gary. I just noticed his back there too, yeah. Yeah, I, I guess I'll read you the question from Anka. Please share the best way to save old pictures by scanning or CDs or what? So, um, old, or to save old pictures. Yeah, scanning is the best way. And there are companies now that will do that for you. There are apps that'll do it. But if you have hundreds of old pictures, like I do, uh, the best way is to you know give them to some company that can just um, scan them for you. And then I would not use a CD because, you know, one of these days there won't even be CD players. I would um, put it on a hard drive, an external hard drive, or in the cloud. A lot of people put stuff up in the cloud. I use hard drives. I'll show you. I only have one in front of me, but I, can you see how tiny this is? Yeah. This is, a, this is the one I travel with. So I take this with me to back up all the pictures while I'm traveling. But um, you can get, this is a two terabyte, you can get a five terabyte, you can get a 12 terabyte, it'll hold a lot of pictures. Um, and then you can just keep them all that way. And then you just plug it into your computer and you can see them all. But, but scanning, I think, is the best way, of course, to, to save all those old pictures if you have that energy. I haven't scanned mine. <laughs> Sonia? You are incredible in so many ways. Wow. Thank I, you. Uh, uh, just trying to grab the feeling that I have. And I hope I, I was looking for a Friday song, but it's okay. They left. Oh, yeah, uh, he left. Huh? I know it's Friday. It's fine. But it's really to, to oh. grasp the feeling before the weekend, if we can hold it more. Mm -hmm. the, the beauty of the world that we, we tend to forget. Day to day, the world is not beautiful anymore. So it's just, wow. There are the like corners in, the, of course, in New York City too, maybe the corners of humanity, especially that you showed us the, the beauty of humanity that we kind of forget yeah. day to yeah. day. And, and you know, I, it, I rarely take a camera with me when I'm traveling in the United States. I, I should, although I ha always have my phone. But I was in New York quite a few years ago. I grew up in New York City. I was in New York with, with a, a cinema society. We were there to see a lot of movies. And they had some walking tours included as part of the. And it's the first time I brought a camera with me to New York. Your own city, wherever you live, is a wonderful place to just see it through the camera for a change because you see things in a different way. My husband used to say, I never see things except through a camera. He thought that was a bad thing. But sometimes it's good to look through a camera and uh, and get a different perspective of, of the, your your day-to-day -day things totally totally yeah. I, oh yeah. i asked jeremy if he could come back on to sing but he's there in the car they went to pick up my grandchildren from school so uh, uh, we will you know we'll wait for him next time another time i, I realize i'm not on i will it's say really inspiring and just perfect 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 um way to finish you know to end the friday and start the weekend if we can just hold it Sonia, it's, it's gail and hi gail i loved this could you hold up that hard drive again please that blue hard drive that you were yeah, yeah tiny, okay. i'll give you uh, here's my phone here's the hard drive you can see a size thank you thank you tiny 
I totally loved this. Thank you so, so much. And Thank Shabbat you, Shalom. Gail. Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Shana Tova for Thank those you. of you celebrating. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. It was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Yael. Thank you, Yael. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Have a great weekend.